Dear God, we thank you for the Sabbath. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to gather and study your word. As we are going to go into understanding the words written in the Bible, we pray for your guidance. We pray for your spirit. We pray for your presence amongst us so that we are able to glean the truth that you would have us to glean today. And may the truth that we are going to glean act as a meal that will give us strength during the journey that we are in toward the pearly gates. We thank you, dear Lord, for, for the Sabbath, and we thank you for the, all the people that are gathered on this platform. May you be with us today and forever. This is our humble prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to lead in a study that we we have we have had discussions with with Nyasha as a family regarding that particular particular study. So she she's going to be helping me if I miss out on one or two points. The study was triggered. Uh, by a presentation by Elder P that he did, I think, um, a couple of weeks ago when she, when he alluded to, to Paul and his attitude towards women. So what we are going to basically do is, um, I'm going to be leading, but I'm going to open up to everyone to, to discuss. The notes that I have, I'm old school. I still do notes in a, in a book. I love actually writing with my hand. Okay. So I know I may not be able to, to finish everything that's written in my notes, but at least if we are able to engage and discuss and talk and share, our thoughts with regards to the verses that we are going to discuss that were written by a very powerful evangelist during his time in his name is Paul. So if I'm to give a title for our lesson is uh, Women and Paul. That's basically what I want us to, to discuss this Sabbath. Okay, before I begin, Emma, what time do I finish? It's 11.30, is it? Uh, it's 11.45 normally. Well, 11.30 to 11.45. It's usually an hour or an hour and a quarter that you can present. So you just start All right. Okay, thank you. Curtis is leading out. <laughs> okay, all right. It's okay. So I'll give you a time warning when it's approaching time up. Don't worry. Okay. All right. It's okay. Okay. So uh, we are going to read or have someone to read from the book of uh, First Corinthians chapter, chapter 14, verse 34. First Corinthians 14, verse 34. Nyasha can read for us. Okay. Verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Verse 35. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Okay, so 
so Paul here is saying that uh, the women should keep quiet in the church. And then he say he, he goes further to say that uh, if they have anything to say in church, they shouldn't say it. They should hold their peace. Wait until church is done. Like today, we are finishing at, at 12. So if it were during Paul's time, they would wait. We all women in this platform would have to wait until 12 midday. Then uh, when they've gone home, uh, they wait for, for the husband to rest, have a glass of water. And when the husband is rested, then they can then say, uh, look, there's something that was discussed in church, A, B, C, D. Then they ask their husbands. And in verse 35, is that the one that says it's a shame? Verse 35 says it is a shame for women to, to speak in church. So before we, we, we try to, to do a forensic study on this verse, to dig through it, I want to, to ask what the problem is with this verse, particularly verse 35. So let's read verse 35 again. <clears throat> verse 35. And if they will learn anything, let them ask, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. All right. So that was verse 35. If they are to learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in church. Okay. What is the problem with this verse besides sexism? Or we call it sexism. What is the other problem that is in that verse? Anyone wants to try? Um, can I try? Gender roles. Oh, yes, yes. Um, besides women not having a voice, um, it's almost like they saying um, it's it's oh sorry. They they have to they beholden they have to ask their husbands. Um, mm -hmm. they have to ask their husbands first mm -hmm. and it's their husbands who will teach them because they learn everything from their husbands okay. so it's like uh, even if they seems like they can't think for themselves they it's their husbands who do the thinking for them okay Ignatius. All right. Thank you, Natalie. Yes. This is Natalie. That was Cedra. <laughs> oh, that was Cedri. This is Natalie. Um, is it to do with um learn at home? Sounds like the women stay home. You can learn at home, don't come in the synagogue. Well, I'm not sure what you're trying to bring out. It says if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. So oh don't 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 talk in church. Yeah. In the synagogue. Okay, thank you, uh, Natalie. Uh, there's something else I'm I'm actually looking looking for. Anybody who can read my my mind, it's in verse thirty five. It's discrimination. Okay, let me give you a hint. It's it discrimination is that is evident there, okay? Someone was speaking, who is it? No, sorry, I just said, was it to do with the word shame? You carry on. All right, with the word shame, what exactly?
You want to expand? Um, no, I was just thinking in the, that it's it's even more than don't speak at church. It's it, it it's an extreme position that if you do speak at church, you say anything at church. There's a shame there. It's a put down for women. I mean, but I still think that's probably sexism. So I'm not sure if I could have answered your question. I don't think it's answering the question. Okay. All right. Yes, it's 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 um it's a, it's a good observation. Um. Anybody else? Okay, so I'll 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 read the verse again. I'll ask Nasha to read the verse again and then trigger some thoughts from the yeah. Okay, it's saying, and if they would learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. All right. So the sentence that I think is got discrimination in it is a sentence that says, let them ask their husbands at home. It is discriminating women against other women. How so? Simba. Yes, Ignatius. Yes, tell me, what well, do you see in that sentence? What I'm seeing is we have women who are not married. What do yes. you mean? Yes. Those who are not married, they are not going to ask anyone. <laughs> who, who do they? So if, I, if I'm a woman, I go to church and I do not have a husband. And yet the most prominent preacher of the time is telling me that if I have questions at church, I can't ask a church, I have to go home. And his definition of home is a home with a husband. So if I am single, who do I ask? That's a point that I just wanted to, to, to put through there. Yes, Magda said, uh, father, I agree, I agree. Yes, you could ask your father or your brother, uh, etc. I'm actually looking into the sentence itself, right? That already it is putting some sort of a, a discrimination amongst the women. They are, Paul is, I mean, that sentence is sort of um, placing a husband as a central figure in the life of a mature of, of, of a mature woman so it's a, it's a it's a problem that i i noticed uh personally in that verse and therefore he, we had to go into the background of the verse as suggested in elder peace presentation that there is a background there is a history behind what paul is particularly particularly saying or his words. Okay. So there is a, a historian. There is a historian whose name is Joven now. I'm going to post a PDF document. See my phone. I'll post it on the group so that it's a very short one that we can, so that we can actually for further study and actually read. So I'm going to quote, uh, where is the quotation that I want to read? All right. So Roman society is by definition a patriarchy where either father or the husband had the central role both in society and family. So I agree with Magda. They, Magda is saying that if you don't have a husband, you then need to go in and ask your father. All right. So men were citizens of Rome, 
while women were citizens only through the extension of their male relatives. Despite such a limited role and life confined in the household, Roman women still managed to gain influence in the Roman Empire and at times even decide the fate of the state. So this uh, history student, historian, her name is An Anisia, Anisia Leko. Yeah, this article is a 2021 article. She's commenting on the how the, the, the Roman society was, was ordered. And she says, yeah, it was a patriarchy. And the father or the husband are the ones that had central role in society and in the family. So if you are a if you were a woman, you were not considered a, a citizen. Remember, during this time, it's pagan Rome that was ruling prophetically in the world. And the, the Jews were a state that was under the rulership of of Rome. So Paul is, re is living in that society. And in this particular society, he is writing to members in the church whose women, whose wives, rather, whose wives or whose women would only become me members or would only become citizens through a male figure. So in order for a woman to be a citizen, you would be attached either to your father, to a husband, or to a brother. So that is the background under which Paul is, is writing, okay? So we'll go back to the verse again and ask people to comment. So we'll go to verse 34. Based on the little history and the, uh, the little conte context that we have now. Verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but okay. they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. All right. Uh, okay. Anybody wants to comment on verse 34? When Paul is saying, let your women keep quiet, right? For it is commanded for them to be, to do what? To keep quiet, to keep quiet in the churches. Who is the it there? It is not permitted. Who yeah. is the it? You would say that it is the law, um, for it is not permitted them speaking. Um, it's not permitted for them to speak. Um, but I have a question. But they are commanded to be under obedience. Also, said the law. What? What? Which law is that? Is that the Jewish law, or is that the societal law that you're referring to? Yes, that's my question. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, you don't know. Okay. Ignatia? Yes. It, I'm not sure if it, it's a law, but is it submit yourselves to your husband? I'm not sure that's the law, though. It's one of the verses, submit yourselves, wives, to your husbands, but it's not the law, is it? We... I'm not sure we, where you come from, sorry. We, we, which law could Paul be referring to? Well, um, different uh, uh, translations of the text refer to the law of Moses. Okay. I'm not sure if the translations are correct, but at least they offer insight into the possibility that it's the law of Moses. All right. Okay. So you're suggesting that it is the law of Moses. Yeah. So according to the law of Moses, it was also shameful for women to speak in the church, is it?
if it is the law of Moses, I'd I'd want to look further into where we know it is the case, but I'd want to know further into which specific uh where specifically Moses instructs gives that instruction. All right. So if I may ask further, Curtis, <laughs> this, this letter is being written to the Corinthian church, is it? So mm. where, where the Corinthians um Jews were they hundred percent Jews, all of them, the church? No. No. Okay. Uh why would Paul refer them to the law of Moses? Exclusively to the law of Moses. They are not Jews. The Ignatius first one. Oh, go on, yeah, carry on. No, carry on. Um, verse 34 in the Good News Bible, it says that the women should keep quiet in the meetings. They're not allowed to speak as the Jewish law says they must not be in charge. <laughs> I don't know if it's referring to the fact that disobedience is, is to do with submission and being in charge rather than specifically being they can't speak in okay. the church because they weren't even allowed in the tabernacle, were they? So I don't know if that would apply even, but it's that principle of perhaps mm -hmm. it's the principle of they're not, right. not to be in charge. All right. So there is a possibility um, that see, by converting into the Jewish religion, it meant that, because remember, Paul says that uh, you were grafted into the Jewish system. Mm. So there's a possibility that by being grafted into the Jewish system, you then have to obey the law of, of, of Moses, is it? Now, I want to bring in some, some more context into the verse, because remember, this is the same Paul who says there is no Jew, no Gentile, no male or female, no slave or free, right? So I, I just want to bring more context into the societal surroundings under which Paul is actually writing. And I want to suggest that if you bring not only the Jewish law, uh, but if you also bring the society under which the culture and the setting under which Paul is writing, it can unlock a lot of things, right? For example, the law, the Roman law itself, remember, okay, one thing about the, the, the Jewish belief, the Jewish belief itself and its culture, they were intertwined. Their belief system and the culture, the two were interwoven. The culture was interwoven into their religion, right? And it was also interwoven with societal expectations for the time. At least that is what I'm suggesting. Now, going to the history, of the time under which Paul is writing here, based on this article. It is actually saying that women uh, women were only would only become citizens through the extension of their male relatives, right? So they would only become citizens of Rome through the extension of their male relatives. So if I am seated in that congregation, and I'm a new convert into this Jewish uh, religion. When Paul would say to me, it is not permitted that women should speak in church, right? I could actually relate even to the laws of Rome. Women were not allowed to speak in public, right? If you're a woman, you're life was only limited in the home and you were not allowed to speak in public. It was actually considered to be to be shameful, so to speak. Okay, let me go to there is uh, 
a poet who lived around the, the first century, whose name <laughs> is Jovenal, okay? I just want to quote something that this poet says. He's a secular poet. So, so he says, wives shouldn't try to be public speakers. They shouldn't use rhetorical devices. They shouldn't read all the classics. There ought to be some things women don't understand. If she is to correct somebody, let her correct her girlfriends and leave her husband alone. So this is uh, Juvenal. If you look for him on Google, it will tell you that he was a first century Roman poet or satirist. So... This juvenile says something that echoes the attitude through which Paul is writing the, the text. Because remember, this Paul, right, is the one who had said there is no Jew, no Gentile, because of the gospel, right? Paul's gospel, Paul's message is to say, because of this Jesus of Nazareth, who has died and resurrected, we are now all equal. That is Paul's message. Agreed? Do we agree to that? Do we sure. agree that Paul is preaching equality? Yes. That is the gospel, is it? Mm-hmm. Right. So if Paul is preaching equality, right, he, my, my attitude towards reading First Corinthians would not be to go back to Moses. I would suggest that Paul is trying to bring his message through, but while taking note of the society around him, the societal expectations and the law of the land around him. So Paul is not wanting to give them an overdose. His message is radical. But in it being radical, it is interwoven with wisdom in it. Right? That is my interpretation of, on this particular place that we are. There is First Corinthians chapter 11 that we Ought, that I want us to 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 discuss as well. Now, before I I proceed, uh, there is something that I just want to to quote here. Uh, that says, for both pagan and Jewish women, religion served to uphold the rigid expectations for women in Greek or Roman society. Roman religion encompassed both political, uh, both political religion, which served the interests of the state, and domestic religion, which was practiced at home. So the setup, the setup of uh, the setup of the of, of, of society during that particular time, it was strictly ordered. It was strictly ordered, right? There was the home and there was the political environment of society. So the way the society was ordered needed to be reflected in the home. Okay? So the home itself, when you got back, I'm actually flipping between two articles. So if I go back to the other article, it actually points that if you were a politician and you wanted to make it in politics, right? If you wanted to make it in politics, you were supposed to order your home perfectly. So the way women contributed in society or in politics was in the manner that they actually ordered their homes. 
if the wife was obedient, if the wife was courteous to visitors, hospitable, if the wife was orderly in terms of uh, the way they would actually physically order the home, cleaning, etc., if the wife or the woman would be able to, you see, listen to your husband, obey what the husband says, and order the children according to what the husband would say, that person would even make it uh, politically. So it says, as a woman's life would revolve mainly around the house, her general education wasn't a point of interest. Usually it included skills needed for running a household and raising the children. Interested, interestingly enough, under Emperor Augustus, a new law was introduced. So during the time of Augustus Caesar, there is a law that was actually introduced that formalizes an already existing prejudice. Women who were not married by the age of 20 would be subject to marginalization and some legal penalties. Laws like these demonstrate how Roman women were valued in society. According to society and the state, they were expected to marry and have their lives revolve around the household, husband, and children. Right? So this is how a woman's life had to be ordered. Before we even talk about Moses, we are talking about society and we are talking about a an evangelist who is going to evangelize in this particular society and this is what they know this is all they know and remember these were actually laws under the roman society or in the roman society rather right ignatius yes uh can i ask a question on that mm -hmm. So you pointed out that Paul is writing this letter to the people in Corinth and those in Corinth are new converts into Christianity. They're not coming forth a Jewish heritage. Mm -hmm. When Paul is writing to writing the letter of Romans, writing the various letters that make up the book of Romans, um, he's also writing to, writing to the, a similar type of demographic. Am I correct in saying that um, it's mixed of Jewish people as well as um, yes. former yes, patients? Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. So how come in, in Romans 16, mm -hmm. um, uh, let me get, get the verse, sorry. Romans 16 verse 1, he is saying to his audience, I commend you, uh, Phoebe, our sister, and he's essentially, you know, uh, saying, listen to Phoebe, and uh, I think I think her name's a a Aquila, Aquila, um, two women, uh, Priscilla, sorry, yeah. um, sorry, these women teachers. Okay. Sorry, yeah. it is, it's Romans, sixteen, oh. verse one, the chapter essentially, but verse one. Mm -hmm. It's Romans or First Corinthians. No, I'm saying Romans. Oh, okay, Romans. Okay. Mm -hmm. 16 he brings up these women teachers and says to them listen to these women teachers because yes. they're servants of the church and they can teach you and etc so how come it, it seems like he's giving two different instructions okay. to a similar type of audience all right okay the same thing actually happens in first corinthians chapter 16 um verse 19 he says, the churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much um, in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to use that particular verse to be able to try and explain what's happening um, to the yeah. in the Romans as well. Okay. So... This is how the Roman life was actually structured. It was structured between the home and the society, public and private, right? So remember, uh, 
in the public, women were not allowed to speak. So the question now was, during the Roman times, was, is church public or private? You see? So while Paul is addressing churches, he would apply wisdom in addressing that particular question ringing around society. So in most cases, churches were held in homes. Remember, he was evangelizing, coming up with a little church with four or five members. So when the church was in the house, right, that was treated as private life and not public. And remember, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, what does it say? It says that the women are supposed to ask their husbands at home. So when the church is being held in the house, right? Remember, Aquila and Priscilla are actually married. Their husband and wife, is it? Right? And they have a church that is in their house. So in the house, Paul would teach. The woman can go ahead and also participate. They can go ahead and and teach. Now, as the church grows and it constitutes many families, the wise preacher would then have to put a restraint again on the women because it would cause commotion in the society. You see now. So in private spaces, right? In private spaces, women could air out their their views in a humble manner, all right? So let me read something just to, to further qualify, qualify that point. In Roman political religion, especially in cults devoted to issues of fertility and childbirth, women played an active role, but one in keeping with their assigned duties as wives and mothers, in Roman, in Roman domestic religion, right? This, this is the sentence that I just want us to listen to. In Roman domestic religion, the pater familias sacrificed to household gods on behalf of the family, right? Little is known about what role women played. That's in the domestic religion. But both domestic and political religion appear to have reinforced the family hierarchy. Okay, so listen to this one. On the other hand, women sometimes found greater freedom in connection with Eastern religions and religious associations, both pagan and Jewish. Religious involvement thus provided some women the opportunity for more public roles. Eastern religions offered these opportunities in abundance. One example, the Oriental cult of Isis gained great popularity among women during the Hellenistic era. Although this embodied wifely uh, devotion, etc., etc. So the point that I want to put across here is that whereas religion began to grow in the Roman Empire, this particular writer and the other historian they then say that the question was, uh, the, que the main question then became, is religion or is the home private or it's public? Okay, you have said I get you, that makes sense. So let me just further elaborate and finish on that point. So women, they got some sort of liberation, some independence as they joined religion. Because religion had its own technicalities, its own uh, rules, etc. So because of the varying religions and their requirements, some religions were actually liberating to women. And Paul's religion was one of the those religions that women really loved, or uh, women of that time, right? Because it was liberating to, to women. So going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34, I want to suggest that that verse, while we can <laughs> easily direct it to Moses, I, I want to suggest that it is interwoven with 
societal expectations and culture as well. Based on the history around the time that Paul is actually writing. So I'll read it again. I'll ask Nyasha to read it again and perhaps we can develop, uh, perhaps, perhaps everyone can feed into what I'm trying to, to, to put across without necessarily agreeing or disagreeing, but just to understand my departure point. Okay, verse 34. Let your women keep, in, keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Okay, so as also saith the law, th that's a comparison, is it? Mm -hmm. Agreed? It's a comparison. As also saith the law. So if we say this law is the law of Moses, right? It means the first part is referring to something else. Then it's being compared to the law of Moses. Right? But sorry, so if I, any, let me anyone you. wants to, to, to explain this particular verse and put it across in a better fashion. Uh, yes. I just want to understand uh, what you just said. So you're saying if we do say that that law is the law of Moses, then the first half of the verse has to be something else. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that, that, that's the explanation that I'm trying to put across. That The first part of the verse is talking about societal expectations. Then the last part of the verse Paul then says, is also saith the law. So Paul is say, sort of saying, look, what you are required to do by these Romans, if you come to church, our law, also the law of Moses, says pretty much the same thing. All right? So verse 35, then says what? Verse 35. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, mm -hmm. for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. All right. So if they are to learn anything, let them ask at home, that's private life, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church public life. Right? You go and ask Juvenile, the, the, the poet for that time, Juvenile will tell you that a woman... She, he, he gives a, an example there. Uh, this writer says, learning and debate were also considered masculine traits and undesirable in women. Juvenile writing in the latter part of the first century argued that it was exasperating for a woman to discuss Virgil and Homer at the dinner table, right? He then connected an interest in learning with an attempt to enter the sphere of education and eloquence reserved for men. Such a wife, he argued, might as well begin the cross duties and worship and bath with men. You see now. So, uh, learning and debate, these were traits that were considered uh, masculine and they were undesirable in, 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 in women, right? So this Virgil and Homer, I, I went to Google to ask uh, who was Virgil and who was Homer. These were very prominent men uh, during that particular time and people would talk about them the same way we talk about Donald Trump and, and Vladimir Putin, right? So they are saying, he is saying here at the dinner table, this, a woman is not allowed to criticize Virgil and Homer, these men, because they are men. And if he's to criticize anybody, she has to criticize fellow women and not men. This was the expectation, right? in the in the society so when paul says the woman can actually ask the husband 
at home. I want to suggest that Paul is actually being revolutionary, is introducing a major change in the understanding that people has with regards to the role of women in this particular time. Because look, Homer here says at the dinner table, the woman cannot discuss virtue and Homer, but at if this woman has joined Paul's church, Paul's religion, at least at the dinner table, at the dinner table, who, who else is seated at the dinner table? The husband, is it? Or the father or the brother? So at the dinner table, if you are a woman and you're coming from Paul's church, you could discuss these issues because the pastor has said that you can actually ask at home. You're able to talk about anything at home, even things that would have been discussed at church. You are allowed. So it was actually something that is very new during that time. It was actually something that is very revolutionary during that particular during that particular um, time. So there is a hand, Curtis. Yeah, I was just thinking that's an interesting concept. Uh, when you think about like questioning the authority of men, and so assuming that the preacher at the church would have been a man, um, Paul is saying, or society would say, you're not even allowed to question that authority of the man. Whereas as you're putting across, um, Paul is saying, okay, at least you can do it at home. Question yeah. that man's authority. You can, you have the space to do that. So I, I just want to say that's an interesting, yes, uh, yes, yes. to point out the revolutionary nature of Paul's. Yes, right. thank you so much. So if you allow me, are there any questions on 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 34 to 5 to 35? Before I move to First Corinthians chapter eleven, any concerns? Ignatius, it wasn't a question; it was just a comment about the context of the verses. Okay. That the chapter fourteen is about edification mm -hmm. and order in the church and doing things kind of decently in an order. And if you look at, I think it's verse twenty-eight. It's talking about speaking in tongues, and it says, "If there's no interpreter, let him keep <laughs> silence in the church." So mm -hmm. it's a a similar um, wording of 34 that that this man if there's no interpreter should keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God because it's not going to edify anyone if someone speaks in tongues and no one understands it so it's all about edification of the body of the whole group and that that person should keep silence and so nobody would take that verse and say men should keep silence in the church all the time every time they wouldn't we wouldn't do that but it's similar it's a similar concept and then in 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So the context is doing things in order. And this keeping silence is in that context. So there seems to be some confusion and disorder going on. That mm -hmm. it's saying, let the women keep quiet in the church or be reverent, not keep silence and never talk. Because in, in the previous chapters, I think it is 11, where it says that women should prophesy with their heads covered mm. women should pray and prophesy in a public setting which means they can pray and prophesy in a public setting mm. with their heads covered so it's contradictory to say they can't speak at all in this passage and then it, so that they this silence must be in that context but it's not permitted unto them to speak and then they are commanded to be under obedience just like the men are and that obedience is submission to god and silence in the church and respect and reverence and everybody's required to order themselves in that setting so if I think if we can see it from that angle, it's not saying this is just about women. It's not saying women should always be quiet. This this context, there's something going on with disorder in the public setting. And as you say, I like the way you said about 35, that they can learn. And this is revolutionary that they're even in the church setting. This is the first time women have been with men and able to learn together, which, mm -hmm. is, um, which is not how it was in the Old Testament. So I think we have to take all that context. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Curtis has asked, Emma, what is the part in that verse referring to where it says, for it is not permitted unto them to speak? Uh, let me just elaborate. Because in the verse that she read about the men speaking in tongues and etc., it's a specific, uh, you'll say, I'll say type of speech. 
that the men shouldn't do because it creates disorder. Mm -hmm. Whereas verse 34 kind of like generalizes the speaking, like any speaking. Just, uh, yeah, how, how does that fit into what you are describing? Emma, you want to respond to that? I'm not sure. I'm just trying to find out. I'm not sure, but I think I'm trying to shift the way that we look at it because we just automatically assume that that's what it's talking about. And so I'm trying to approach it for, I don't know, it's the bottom line. Um, but I think it must be to do with this context. There's some confusion going on. People are talking at once. I did read years ago, I haven't, I haven't seen this recently, in a Bible commentary that women and men sat on different sides even then, that they were in the same church, but they were on different sides. And even now, some strict Christians do that. And so there was speculation that the women are shouting across to their husbands to talk about this, having this discussion, and it's complete mayhem, basically, because they're talking across each other and backwards and forwards, and it's it's disturbing the congregation. And so this is why the, the context of that, they're not permitted to speak in that setting like that and talk across each other or across other people and go home and do it if you've got a question which to me at the time made sense but i don't know if that's contextually correct um okay. so you're not permitted to speak under these circumstances because there needs to be reverence and that i'm going to replace obedience commanded to be under reverence as the law says everybody should be you know there needs to be some respect in the way the church service is running because corinthians is addressing confusion it seems to me and that's we have to look at that context okay as I say, it contradicts the fact that women can prophesy and pray in public, so it can't be a blanket. They're not allowed to speak ever. That's that was the logic. So it's the women that are con uh, are causing the confusion, and uh, they are being um uh, like order is being is being destroyed by the women. Is it what you're saying? Yes. So there is because they've got questions and it's legitimate to have questions. And Paul's saying, if you've got questions, go and ask them at home. But don't be shouting if you're on one side of the church and Ignatius is on the other. Don't be shouting across Ignatius. What's this about? You know, um, it could, because in that setting, it's not the right place to do it. So the so silencing women was was going to make the church uh, uh, in order. Like, yes. Yeah. This is how it should be done. It wasn't saying women should never speak. It was saying, let them in this context because it says, let your women, it's addressing the husbands in some way, you know, do it this way. Don't do it publicly here. Go home and do it if you've got those kind of questions. Okay. So Emma, yeah, I, I think incorporating that into your your, your thoughts, um, it would be important also to incorporate the history, right? Yeah, so I don't know if that's historically... Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the thing. This particular history and context that we are just trying to, you know, yeah. All right. Hence the okay. I've seen a hand. That's blessing there. Blessing. Yes. Uh, Quiet. Yes. Uh, I wanted to uh, just give a, a comment on 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 these verses uh, because a few years ago as well maybe many years ago, I don't remember. I did read some historical information. Maybe it's not relevant anymore because I don't even remember the sources, but I found that um, that commentary about the history of Corinth quite interesting. And it did suggest that um, in certain cities in Asia Minor, in ancient Greece and Asia Minor, you had women of influence or class like women that were rich essentially and those rich women uh would have a tendency of being basically they would want to control certain situations within society and and i'm not saying it was inappropriate to do that and uh that commentary i read suggested that some of those rich women actually joined the church and when they joined the church they came with uh some baggage and they wanted to essentially direct how the church should go based on their external influence and power and Paul was trying to address that particularly in Corinth so so I just thought to mention that that perhaps it would be worth looking into in terms of more of the history that actually was 
what was actually happening in Corinth because that that commentary was just suggesting that there was a lot of there, there, there was a lot of confusion that was going on in the church of Corinth and Paul had to address that confusion so I'm not justifying what he said because I think what he said was wrong in any context personally that you know to just say it's a shame for women I don't think that's something that's true I guess is what I'm saying he may be forgiven because of the society he lived in, but I don't think that's a, a true statement that we would say this is correct. But it does seem that there was some disorder that was going on in that church that Paul had to address, and he decided to address it that way. So yeah, that's the comment I wanted to to give. So um, right. it's not an overall statement that you have to believe that women were not allowed at that time to speak in the church. They were, but under some kind of order. All right. Uh, let me read something from the history again, from the history uh, of the time that Paul is writing, particularly in Corinth. Right. A cosmopolitan and multi-ethnic city, Corinth of Paul's day was an important seaport for the Roman Empire. Despite a reputation of rebelliousness and immorality, the citizens of Corinth found themselves subject to Roman law and societal structures. So is this what you're talking about, uh, Blessing? No, the, the one I read was just talking about um, essentially that women generally didn't have rights in in the Roman Empire and in Corinth in particular, but women of status had privileges that other women didn't have, and some of those women of status joined the church. So, so that's the history I was, I was talking about. Uh, not not this in particular, but yeah, I I do agree that definitely right. the Roman Empire had influence on Corinth and it, okay. it tried to enforce its societal structures. Yeah, but I was just talking about women of status. All right. Yeah. Okay, let me go further down. It says, the members of the Corinthian churches, both Jewish and Gentile, lived their lives in the context of the rigidly ordered world of first century Greek or Roman culture. This world placed tremendous importance on order and classification. There was a place for everyone and everyone in his place. A person's place was predetermined by age, gender, level of freedom that is slave free or freeborn and citizenship and required a certain behavior in keeping with one's position. Societal order centered on the family, which was envisioned as a microcosm of the state. Within the family household, a person was husband, wife, child, other relative, worker, or slave. The father or oldest brother ruled the family and held ultimate authority over its members under the Roman law. He enforced societal expectations within the family and could punish at his discretion disobedient family members with death, though this was extreme and was probably rare. So this is the history that we are being given around the time that Paul is also writing to the to the to, to, to the Corinthians. And I'm suggesting that as we read it, we need to incorporate the history and the culture around the verses as we are we are rightly doing in uh in this presentation. Because you see the emphasis on women becomes questionable and we need to question that as well, right? That why would Paul emphasize that, well, he's talking about order, etc., etc., but why the emphasis on women and why is it being called a shame that women should actually speak even in the churches? And hence, this history and culture becomes handy in trying to really zero down and understand what is happening and how Paul is trying to manage the situation 
and how he is implementing wisdom uh, in actually in his ev evangelistical efforts because he is evangelizing in a radical society the laws themselves like what i have read there there is a place for everyone and everyone is supposed to be in place okay what was the reference from the last reading please i'll post it on on the group it's an article that was done by someone a historian so uh I'll, I'll 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 post it after the presentation on the uk group so that we can everyone can go through it for for context okay the one way in which a woman entered the forbidden public realm was by speaking and according to some ancient authors learning uh learning in quotes Plutarch illustrated well the connection between speech and the public arena when he wrote. Theano, the wife of Pythagoras, we know Pythagoras from Pythagoras' theorem, in putting a clock about here, about here exposed the arm. Somebody exclaimed, a lovely arm, but not for the public, she said. Not only the arm of the vicious woman, but his speech as well ought to be not for the public. And she ought to be modest and guarded about saying anything in the hearing of outsiders, since it is an exposure of herself. For in her talk can be seen her feelings, character, and disposition. So that's a quotation from Plutarch, who lived around that particular time. And then this person explains to say, here a woman was to guard her speech in public. In fact, the rare women who dared to engage in public speech were censured for inappropriate behavior. A woman of the first century, right? Okay, then he calls another woman of the first century who went against the odds and began to what? And began to, to actually speak. So the first century is around the time that Paul is writing. Okay? The first century is, is from 1 to 100. So this is the period in which Paul is actually writing. And that is the context uh, around the period in which Paul is actually is writing. So there's an interesting one. Well, there are many verses I could have done. I know for time, I'm not going to go to 1 Timothy uh, and Titus. But then 1 Corinthians, please. Okay, time check is 15 minutes. Thank you, Kate. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Well, that's one. Verse, is it verse 2? Yeah, verse 2. Mm. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is all that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman <clears throat> be not covered, let her also be shorn. Uh, but if but if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image of the and the glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as much as woman is of the law of the man even so is the man also by the woman 
but all things of God. Judge in yourselves. It's up to this. That's Six, 16. 16. Judge in yourselves. It is it comely that a woman pray unto God and covered. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if a man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Okay. Any comments with regards to those verses? So the verses are in in uh, in summary. Paul is saying he's talking about head covering, and he says that the woman should cover their their head, uh, but the men should not, because the man is the head of the woman, is Christ is the head of the of the church. So Paul here is is putting a hierarchy, Christ, then the woman, then uh, who else is the uh, Christ, the husband then the woman actually before the woman there has to be a head that is covered then the woman so we start with the head first and that head must so if the head is not covered this woman is not part of the hierarchy because they haven't covered their head if i had it correctly right then the woman okay so what a can we glean from there uh, based on how would we explain those verses? Kat, what are your thoughts? We are running out of time, so I, I just need to pick you. Um, given your explanation of the previous ones, uh, where Paul is drawing from the cultural, political uh, expectations. Um, I would say, well, what I see is different here, or maybe it's the same, I don't know, you can help me, is that now Paul is drawing from their writings. So he's using parables um, that the Jews are familiar with, um, with regards to Jesus' relationship to the church and etc. So to make a point, to them, he uses something that they're familiar with in their cultural settings and their context to establish that point. Okay. All right. May I just add uh, to that by explaining, then reading some certain quotations from the, the online article that I'm going to share, right? This is by the historian that I've uh, spoken about, that women in this particular time were, they, they were referred to as, they were known to be very dangerous in the Roman Empire, and they could influence the outcome of an election through their conduct. They could actually get a, an opponent killed through their, their conduct. So how they... Roman society or the laws in order to tame the women, they would say that the woman's beauty standards were to be maintained only for the husband in the home. If you remember the story of Cleopatra of Daniel chapter 11, the Cleopatra in Daniel chapter 11, Cleopatra destroyed Caesar through her beauty and she went on to destroy Mark Antony again, again through her beauty, right? So according to this historian, she then says, Roman women did not have direct access to politics and therefore did not usually play a significant, play a significant role. However, they were not entirely powerless. Women were able to influence politics through their marriages and their husbands. If the husband of a Roman woman was in was in an uh, election, for example, she could influence the result through her image, her home, and the way she 
uh, received guests. I've already talked. I've already spoken about this. I've spoken about the uh, the household, and I'll also uh, speak about the woman, the women um, actually participating in poisonings of political uh, um, emperors. Right. I'll also talk about. Right. I will just in, in this writer actually quotes Nancy Reagan, the wife of uh, President Ronald Reagan, in explaining the point of how women were supposed always to be seen to be under their husbands or under men uh, in the society. The author says, as first lady of the U.S., Nancy Reagan once said, for eight years I was sleeping with the president. And if, if that doesn't give you special access, I don't know what does. That was Nancy Reagan saying, I was sleeping with the president all these eight years. So if that does not give me special access, I don't know what gives special access. Sorry, my battery is coming. Yes. Okay. Then beauty in the Roman Empire. Now this is about the hair. Beauty has always played an important role in societies throughout history. The appearance of Roman women wasn't to be neglected because it was thought that her beauty affected the reputation of her husband. If she looked pleasant, it would reflect, reflect favorably upon her husband. Literally speaking, the women the woman was the image of the household and her appearance commit, communicated more than just good genes of, or personal beauty. However, they would be mocked if they, if they overdid it. ETC, ETC, for time, I, I will not be able to, to, to touch on everything that this article is saying, but I'll just give explanations from what I can from what I I remember from the article so regarding that's not the one so, sorry my laptop is running out of power okay so generally Talking about the beauty standards, the women were supposed to be presentable both to their husbands in particular. They were supposed to do your hair. It links up with where, when Paul says the women should not, uh, uh, the beauty of the woman should be inside and not emphasize outside with braided hair, etc, etc, etc. If you go to that history, the Romans, emphasize that the woman's hair would give honor to the husband and therefore rich men would actually pay fortunes of money just for hairdos right and that was infiltrating into the church as well and hence the part of history that i've just read explains that particular part now with regards to head covering now head covering during that time was a way of showing that a woman was submitting themselves or was um yes yeah, submitting themselves to their to the authority of a man right to their husbands so they were supposed to have their 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 hair actually be covered so as Paul is writing, he alludes to what is happening externally. Women's hair was important, right? And as he writes to the church as well, he speaks about the women not shaving their hair, that the hair should be there because it gives honor to the men. And I would want to suggest that that language, right, that the hair gives honor to the men, is borrowed from the society as well, right? That 
the hair gives honor to the to the husband. So there is a lot in 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 the verse that I I could have actually skipped, but I just want to open to questions and discussions. We have three minutes remaining. Question. Question. Yes, uh, Titus. Um, so when Paul, uh, kind of, uh, going back to the first verse that you read, gives a, we'll say, solution, or uh, to the problem, where mm -hmm. Paul looks and sees the circumstances that women face in the church and in society and politics, and says, "Okay, here's a solution for you." Go and ask your husbands at home. Be free to debate the ideas at home, um, given society. Uh, would we? How do we? How do we take that and and say like, should we do the same today in terms of where society restricts certain things? We offer solutions. Should we fight against society? Like how how does our positioning with regards to these matters differ to Paul, or is it the same? Should we approach them the same way that Paul did, or should we uh, fight more? Like, yeah, I don't know. Does okay. my question make sense? Right. I want to suggest that we are different from Paul. Paul is living during the the initial days of the gospel. Paul is introducing the gospel to the world. Right, And as he does that, he does it in the fashion that is very wise. I believe Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit as he does that because he uses the method of progression. He gives them a little dose first and the dose and as, as the, the button is being, as the stick is being passed to the next generation, the next generation up up to us, the last generation to live in this world, we are no longer giving a little dose because right now humanity is prepared, is ready to hear a radical transformation in terms of how society must be ordered. So during Paul's time, Paul is introducing, Paul understands what Paul, what Christ came here to accomplish. And Paul understands that Christ came to this world to accomplish equality. So when Paul actually says, well, this society, the way the society is ordered, everyone has a place in the society based on your age, your gender, and your position being a slave or not being a slave. Paul already say, he has already mentioned that, you know what, because of this Christ Jesus, there is no woman, there is no gentile, there is no Jew, there is no free, there is no bond. That is the gospel, right? When he then approaches situations and circumstances, he begins to apply wisdom. Because remember, externally, the world, humanity is not ready. Though the church already has the message but humanity is not ready, you see now. So Paul approaches the situation or he approaches the gospel, he introduces the gospel to the world in a very wise fashion because he is introducing the beginning part of the progression that's supposed to run from his time, suggesting to our time, the line of the 144,000. So when we get to our time, we are supposed now to be radical about the issues that Paul was radical and revolutionary in his time. But when we look at it in our time, it was not so radical or revolutionary. You see now. So Elder Paminder is a term that he uses uh, for that. It starts with a P, but I have forgotten, I've forgotten that, uh, that. Fragmentism. Sorry? I think it was pragmatism. I don't know if that's the one you're looking for. Pragmatic. Okay. It was what? You said pragmatic. Pragmatic. Yeah, that's what you said. Uh, I think pragmatic. 
Well, it was it was something to do with the way Paul was approaching issues. It was uh, it mind, that remind me. It was not I, it's, the word is not compromise, but it's what I think of the word policy. It's what policy. Anybody who remembers can type it there in the comment section. Ah, I, I, I forgot it. But the word explains exactly what I'm struggling to put across here. That he had to apply wisdom in dealing with the in dealing with the policy. Okay, I was I was also going to say policy. Yeah, it could be be policy right policy or principle I, I i i i don't remember yeah but if i do i'll post it on the on the uk group um so actually if you look for for the video that that elder perminder did the presentation the the video is titled with that particular word and that is what triggered this particular he uh study in research so Paul was being wise in summary, uh, or policy or pragmatism. Okay, all right. So Paul was being wise in approaching these issues during 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 his time. So as we read verses such as, I would love people to to really discuss verses such as First Timothy chapter two, or look into them and try to understand what they mean. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 to 15, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, and uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. Actually, if you just read 1 Timothy chapter 2, the whole of it, and 1 Peter chapter 3, the whole of it, there are issues that are, if you don't read them correctly, and you, instead of applying, you copy and paste you really become out of place, especially in this era that we are living. And hence, we have to use proper methodology in understanding um, Paul and his writing. Not only the lines, the line of progression, but I believe that we should also attempt to go into the verse itself, dig into the verse, understand the history and the culture, the surrounding that particular passage of scripture, then be able to really explain it, right? And be able to understand it. Then we can have the lines, uh, the line of progression is a second witness to what we would have explained using the, the verses. So I think that is the... I'll, I'll end here and uh, I'll what am I supposed to do now Curtis? Uh, you can pray to close. All right so I'll pray in closing okay so if you kneel with me pray dear God we thank you for the opportunity to be able to look into the passage of scriptures that we have just attempted to understand this Sabbath. We pray that as we continue to study and to understand especially the testing issues for our time, we able we be able to see more light that you have already revealed in the passages in the writings of Paul to do with women. We pray that as you have commissioned us to teach this message or this gospel to the world, we be able to be eloquent enough and to be able to explain the issues that you have laid bare for our understanding in our time. I want to pray for everyone uh, that has attempted to, to listen and understand what we have learned today. 
and those that are still struggling to understand some of the things that we discussed, may you continue to bring it to light to them so that they also understand when you'll be able to explain these verses to those that would want to understand them. As we go through the Sabbath, pray that you continue to be with us and give us more light and vision as we continue to worship. This is my humble prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.